is Dr. Felicia Ford, Dean and Interim President at Jake's Divinity School. It is our pleasure to bring to you virtual chapel services each week that are designed to enhance your spiritual formation through worship, prayer, liturgical expressions, inspirational words, and much, much more. We encourage you to tune in each Thursday at 11 a.m. Central Standard Time to receive what God has for you through the chapel service. Now, let us open our hearts and minds and enter into the worship experience. Welcome students to Jake's Divinity School Chapel Services. This is your time to worship in the space and the place that you are in. This week, it's all about contemplation, holy contemplation, thinking, reflecting, being grateful for where you are and where you know God is taking you. In this worship period, I challenge you to not just worship with your mind, but worship with your heart and worship in a space of reflecting, reflecting on the goodness of God, the greatness of God, and the faithfulness of God. Holy contemplation. Contemplate on how good he's been to you. Let us pray. Father, we thank you that as we meditate upon your holy word and commit to doing everything written in it, that we not only prosper in the natural, but that we would prosper in the spirit, recognizing your faithfulness toward us and the majesty of your power and how the grace that you have bestowed upon us takes us from faith to faith and glory to glory. Father, we ask this week that you would cause your word to come alive in our hearts in such a way that it births fresh new revelation about who we are and whose we are. Help us to seek your face, seek your hand and seek your ways in all that we do and in every area of our lives, that we may be pleasing unto you and that your glory be revealed in us. Shake the very foundation of darkness and unbelief and cause us to shine your light in the earth. Let us stand firm in the faith, proclaiming boldly the gospel of Jesus Christ in this hour, and we will be forever grateful. In Jesus' name, amen. The peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you, and blessed be the one holy and living God who is a loving God. Now, as we embark upon this time of worship, let us mind our thoughts and direct them towards a devoted Christ focus and holy thought life. Come on, let's worship together.
Now, as we embark upon this moment of silence, let us allow for our hearts and our minds to be thoroughly washed over by the presence of God. Let us come to the place in which we are resting in the centrality of who He is. Let us pray. Dear Lord, as we reflect on all that you are to us and all you have done for us in that you saved us and reconciled us back to you through the shedding of your precious blood on Calvary's cross, we confess our continual need for you. You are our helper, our strength, our protector, our master, our shepherd, our healer, our provider, our peace and our hope. The excellence of your majesty and the power of your truth are what holds us and all things together. We live, move, and have our being in you and through you. We are your offspring. We confess that our lives cannot be productive, impactful, or of any significant purpose without you. For your word says in John 15 and five, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit, but apart from me, you can do nothing. Continue to infuse us, O Lord, with the empowerment we need to complete the work you've chosen us to do and continue to work within us to cause us to will and to do what pleases you the most. May your divine power be expressed in what we say, what we do and think, and may the good works that we do be a discipling testimony to others and bring your name great glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Our Old Testament scripture comes from the book of Isaiah, chapter 40, verses 30 through 31. And it reads, Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. And then too, we have a reading from the New Testament, 2 Corinthians 12, verse 9. And he said to me, My grace is sufficient for thee. My strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I would rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Be blessed by the reading of his word. Well, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm Bishop Jonathan Alvarado here in Atlanta, Georgia. Grace Church International is the congregation that I serve here, the Grace Fellowship of Churches, the Total Grace Movement. I'm also the president and professor of theology at the Greater Atlanta Theological Seminary, and it is my great privilege to be with you, the Jake's Divinity School Chapel, in this season of worship and celebration. I want to honor uh, your founder, uh, Bishop T.D. Jakes, and the work that he has done over the decades for the kingdom of God, for the times in which we live. He is a great man, a man worthy of emulation. I'm grateful for this time to share in this moment and to think about some of the more weighty matters of the faith that as Christian leaders, burgeoning leaders, seminarians, students, and servants, we perhaps need to be thinking about. Uh, in this moment, my theme, the topic, the, the instruction that I received concerning our time together is holy contemplation, how one thinks about and ruminates on their faith and how that faith flows into the rest of their lives. I want us to think about that on today from this thought 
As a man or a woman thinks in his or her heart, so is he or she. From Proverbs 27, 23, 7. I think it's important that we consider that Paul admonished us in the New Testament, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, honest, just, lovely, of good report, if there's any virtue, if there's any praise, think on these things. So the idea of spiritual contemplation is a notion that is of paramount importance for our own spiritual growth and our maturity in Christ. Not only that, the mystics, the church fathers, the, the desert fathers, and all of those persons to whom we look, uh, that look to God and hope and to whom we look for our own spiritual nurture, had a particular affinity to and relationship with contemplation of their faith, holy contemplation, how rumination over the faith impacts our lives. Here's the reality. The busyness and bivouac of the contemporary Christian life, particularly in the West, oftentimes calls us out of moments of contemplation, seasons of rumination over consequent matters of the faith because of the demands of ministry, because of the, the zitzim leben, the circumstances of life, because of the things that you and I have to necessarily attend to to be able to carry out the work unto which we've been called, oftentimes thinking about the faith is, is secondary. We've become a society of Christian leaders that is more inclined toward functional utilitarianism than of pastoral theological approaches and endeavors. You'd be surprised the number of persons, bishops and pastors and leaders with whom I have to do that I have to remind that ours is one of the most noble and academically inclined, intellectually inclined pursuits in history. Whereas nowadays, uh, it seems that if we learn formulaic ways of operating church ministries or even adopt business practices and baptize them in prayer and a scripture or two, that we have begun to do the work of the Lord, the work of the quote unquote kingdom. But I'd like to suggest to you today at least three things. The first of which is we have to wrestle with embedded versus uh, deliberative theology. We're going to have to use thinking as an exercise in spiritual discipline and, and, uh, and we're going to have to grapple with the ontological morphology of critical engagement with the faith. Let me say a few, few things about that and I think that it may be beneficial for us today. The first of which is this, embedded theology versus deliberative theology. None of us come to the faith, none of us come to the work of Christ, None of us come to our station of ministry, tabula rasa. We don't come blank slate. We come with a set of embedded principles. We come with a set of embedded traditional values and attitudes, ways of seeing the world, ways of being in the world that are so deeply embedded and ingrained in who we are that we see the world through the framework of that embedded theological disposition. It's not a bad thing. All of us have it. There is no escaping it. But for those of us that would be thinking persons of faith and deal more intentionally in holy contemplation, how we ruminate over the faith and how that rumination shapes the faith that we live out in our lives, we're going to have to be more deliberative about our thinking and recognize that perhaps the theological systems that we have received are perhaps not wrong, perhaps not flawed, but certainly partial, maybe even impoverished. And it necessitates then that we engage the faith with a more critical mindset. When I say critical, I don't mean negative. I just mean a more engaged intellectual approach. You see, friends, the problems of the 21st century will not be solved by thinking from the 19th century. The challenges that are afoot and present in 2022 are going to require a more engaged theological approach for solution. The internal quandaries that you and I wrestle with by reason of the times in which we live and the God who called us to serve this present age 
is going to require that we, in some ways, embrace our embedded theology, adjust our embedded theology, challenge our embedded theology, and ruminate over a broader theological narrative that may invite us to see the world differently, to see the church differently, and to operate in the faith differently. You see, transitioning from embedded theology to deliberative theology requires two things, the first of which is the easier of the two. That's learning new information and getting new understandings. You see, the human brain has the potential by virtue of the fact that we only use 8% of our brain capacity for vast uh, informational gathering and learning. As a matter of fact, my son, Dr. Chris Rowland, uh, my spiritual son, who is a MD, PhD, uh, literally uh, is a brain surgeon, a neurosurgeon, uh, sat down with me one day and I wanted to probe him about this idea of the brain, the human brain and our capacity to learn. And he's the one that disabused me of the knowledge or the, the thought that our human brains and the capacities to learn were not there. No, 8% of our human brain is what the average human being uses, 8%. If we used 10% of our brain capacity, we would be super geniuses just because of that incremental increase of the use of brain capacity. So learning new things is not the problem. The problem Dr. Rowland explained to me was unlearning the old. It's a problem on a multiplicity of levels, the first of which is biological. Synapsis takes place and neural pathways are forged as we learn. Those neural pathways, once they become galvanized and or concretized, begin to form walls that prevent us from assimilating new information that can be expansive or perhaps contradictory to the things we think we already know. So the challenge is not the capacity to learn new, the challenge is the breaking down biologically of the neural walls and creating neural, new neural pathways to be able to learn something new. Here's the bigger challenge. Information and knowledge has a way of connecting with our affective domain, which means that when we really know something, we don't just know it cerebrally, we know it affectively. We have an emotional attachment to that which we believe we already know. So learning new things, especially when they challenge the old things, becomes an affront to our affective domain and we feel indignant, filled with righteous indignation because when someone is presenting new information that may be contradistinctive to that which we already think we know, then it becomes a challenge of our own isness because our emotional stability is now challenged. If what I thought I knew is not correct, then I might not be who I thought I was. The idea is not the learning of new information. The idea is the the letting go of old information that we have built upon. It serviced us well, but now we're growing beyond that information and challenging ourselves to think more expansively, more broadly, more globally, and more cross-culturally to embrace the whole of God's creation and not just the microcosmic creation with whom we have to do on a regular basis. You see, if we're going to talk about holy contemplation, we have to talk about whole contemplation. And part of the challenge is, is that our thinking is oftentimes microcosmic and only within our three-foot world. We only think within the context of the persons, the ideas, the places, and the information with whom we've had to do up to this point. But I believe God is calling us, and if I be a man of God, I want to challenge you to think beyond the borders and boundaries of your current existence, to know that God is calling you and I to greater dimensions and to further spaces to be able to think with holy contemplation in holistic ways about the faith and how that faith 
fleshes out in our lives. But not only embedded versus deliberative theology do we need to think about, but we also need to think about thinking as an exercise of spiritual discipline. It's, it's always curious to me when we start talking about spiritual gifts, we talk about musical gifts and preaching gifts, and we talk about uh, artistic gifts, dance or visual arts. We talk about gifts of mercy and gifts of compassion. We talk about these various and sundry gifts of the spirit, tongues and interpretation of tongues and discerning of spirits and, and, and gifts of administration and things of that nature. But what we fail to do too often is to think about intellect, contemplation, thinking as a spiritual gift, moving it into the realm of God's special endowment on persons that he's called to be able to think about these matters and communicate them more fully to the body of Christ. You see, precious dears, the idea of thinking as an exercise in spiritual discipline first recognizes that my gift is an intellectual gift. I know I got that right because Jesus said, hey, uh, the law is, uh, is couched in these, in these, in these two, two laws. He told the young man, the rich young ruler, he said, I love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, here's the part, with all your mind and with all your strength. And we do really well with loving God with our heart. We do pretty well with loving God with our soul. We do well with loving God with our strength and the exercise of faith. But what about the intellectual love of God? What about contemplation over the things of faith? Think about how we preach. Think about how we bifurcate needlessly between holy contemplation and doing the work of ministry. We do it as it pertains to worship. We got to get outside of these four walls where the real work is, as if worship is not the real work of the people of God. We've got to get out these ivory towers, thinking about it is good, right? But we got to get down in the trenches where the people are, as if thinking and intellectual pursuit and coming to God as spiritual discipline is not as equally important as the, the hands love of God and the heart love of God and the soulical love of God. Jesus said, love him with our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, and with all of our strength. And my dear friends, I think it's important that we exercise ourselves under the spiritual discipline of thinking. What does that mean? That means, uh, that means uh, a contemplation. Some of our exercises need to be, listen, not just reading scripture passages and texts to prepare for sermons, not just proof texting, running, our, running through a concordance to try to find every place that the word uh, prosperity is used and building a sermon on all these uh, texts that are disparate and detached all through the text of scripture, but sitting with a text, living with a text, ruminating over the text, allowing that text to master us, not seeking so much the exegetical proficiency with which we approach that text, but rather allowing that text to exegete us. Let not for our mastery of the text, but for the text to be able to master us. When's the last time you just sat with the text and lived with it? When I was being formed in the faith as a young man, uh, one of the things that, that I was challenged to do uh, was to read uh, my father in God, Bishop Lafayette Scales in Columbus, Ohio, where I was raised, challenged us to read a, a, a psalm every morning and a proverb every night for a solid year and to live with them. The Proverbs, the wisdom literature, 31 Proverbs, 31 chapters in, in the book of Proverbs uh, allowed us to read the entire book of Proverbs once a month. We lived with that text for an entire year. When I was trying to learn and grow in the things of the Spirit, one of my mothers in God, Pastor Benita Farr, challenged me to make a part of my daily devotional the reading of Romans chapter 8 from the beginning to the end and sitting with it for 30 minutes or 45 minutes a day, just contemplating different aspects of that text different verses that would stand out to me as I read it every day. And I did so for two and one half years, one chapter in the book of Romans. You see, friends, holy contemplation doesn't allow you to let it go quickly, not just to get a nugget, 
not just to get a sermon, not just to get a germinal idea and run with it as if you and I have embraced the fullness of what God may be trying to speak through that text. Contemplation calls for us to sit with it, perhaps not post so much on Instagram and TikTok about a text until you've lived with it for six months or eight months or a year. So that way that text becomes a part of who you are and your life is mastered and interpreted through the lenses of the text that God is burning and etching by the power of the Spirit in your spirit. Are you hearing what I'm saying to you? I think it's extremely important today. But not only that, exercises that we of, of the ancient mystics, things like Lexio Divina, the repetitious muttering of the text, the idea of meditating in the Hebrew epistemology means to mutter. It means to speak it aloud. I'll not forget when I was at the Wailing Wall in, 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 in uh, Israel in, uh, in uh, 2011. And uh, when I went down and I saw the devout Hasidic Jews as they would come and they would put their prayer requests written down on small pieces of paper and push them into the cracks in the Wailing Wall where they were there to pray. But their prayers and their thoughts toward God were not silent like yours and mine often are. But their thoughts were aloud and they would ruminate and they would mutter that's their meditation, speaking it over and over and over again. In Christian community, the, the, we call that exercise Lexio Divina, where we sit with texts in community and repeat the texts. And after three, four, or five repetitious readings of the text, we begin to share what the Spirit's revelation of that text is for us, both individually and as a collective group. And it is in that contemplation and Lexio Divina, which are only two examples of how you and I can engage in thinking as an exercise in spiritual discipline. Not only discerning between and moving intentionally toward uh, it, deliberative theology versus the embedded theology with which we all come, not only engaging in thinking as an exercise in spiritual discipline, but thirdly, I think it's important that we talk about the ontological morphology of critical engagement with the faith. You see, precious dears, the faith that you and I have received, the faith once delivered, is not static. It is dynamic. The faith that, you know, I know that, that upbraids some people, that makes some people uncomfortable. I might be uninvited because the challenge for many of us is that we want to calcify galvanize, concretize the faith, memorialize it, institutionalize it until we choke the life out of the living faith that's been delivered unto us. The, the, this idea of the ontological morphology of the, of, 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 of the, the Christian faith or critical engagement with the faith is extremely important because when I say the ontological morphology, I'm talking about how living the faith changes our nature. Them old folk I was raised around used to say stuff like when they got saved and began to be sanctified, they used to say stuff like I looked at my hands and my hands looked new. I looked at my feet and my feet did too. The idea was not this physical morphology, but there was an ontological morphology that was taking place in them. Their nature was changing such that their outlook on life was changing. Their dispositions about life in the faith was changing. And it's important that we recognize that because as we recognize that there's ontological morphology taking place when we critically engage with the faith, you and I moving away from it, the embedded theology, building upon the embedded theology that we've received are able to lead others into a fuller, richer, deeper understanding of the ways of God and this movement of the Spirit and the, the, the church that God is calling us to serve this present age. I'll not forget, it was very powerful to me in Acts chapter 2 when Peter was preaching and he declared that, that uh, in, in preaching, in giving the history of, of, of bringing us to the moment of Jesus' uh, salvific work as the savior of the whole planet. He said, at, he described David in this way, and after David had served his generation, he laid down with his fathers, which suggested to me that every one of us has a generation that we're called to serve. 
and that the ontological morphology, the change that must take place in us as we pursue the faith is for the purposes of serving the generation that we're called to serve. You see, dear friends, you cannot serve the 21st century, 2022 and beyond, a, an endemic world, a post-pandemic world with pre-pandemic and 20th century thinking about the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ. I know it's comfortable for us. I know it was good enough for the us and good enough for our parents and good enough for the church back then and it ought to be good enough for, for the people now. It's the gospel. He, 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 Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. Indeed, his person has not changed. His, his, his holiness has not changed. His, 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 his salvific work has not changed. But the culture and the times in which you and I have been called to minister has most certainly changed. And you and I have to be pliable, flexible, and adaptable enough to be able to be effective within that generation. That's what I'm calling the ontological morphology of critical engagement with the faith. You see, if you and I are not willing to expand our thinking, it's F. Scott Fitzgerald that said, it is the sign of a first-class mind to be able to hold opposing thoughts in tension at the same time. Those of you that are in this seminary, this seed bed, this place whereby you are learning and grappling with and engaging with the matters of the faith, you are there as an intentional exercise in discomfort. See, critical morphology, uh, uh, ontological morphology and critical engagement with the faith causes us, calls us into uncomfortable spaces where we're going to have to add, answer critical questions that this generation is asking. We are expert in answering the questions of a previous generation, but we are recalcitrant in our responsibility to answer the questions that this generation is asking. And I believe that you as seminarians and students and burgeoning leaders, some of whom are already placed in significant stations of leadership, are going to have to open your hearts and engage your minds in the ontological morphology of critical engagement with the faith. Reading things that push us to think differently. Reading a Pentecostal theology of, uh, of, of religions. Amos Young wrote that a book entitled Beyond the Impasse, where he critically engages with other religions. It's, it is insufficient in the 21st century to, to just say everybody else is going to hell and not be able to offer a, a salvific and soteriological path for them to be able to track by the Spirit and the efficacious work of the Lord Jesus Christ. How effective could his work be if Jesus did not actually die for the whole world? It's important that we engage in this level of critical thinking such that it changes us. While I have great appreciation for it, I cannot celebrate that millions didn't make it and I was one of the ones who did, knowing the fact that millions didn't make it. Critical engagement with the faith calls for an ontological morphology that says I fall in love with and my heart beats for and bleeds for that which God's heart beats and bleeds for. And that's the least, the last, the lost, the marginalized, the disenfranchised. You see, an ontological morphology will help us to stop following after everything that has been superimposed imperialistically on us. See, many of us have received colonization and called it Christianity. When the truth of the matter is that we have uh, uh, we have a liberative praxis of theology that our Lord Jesus gave us and the Spirit reinforced and God demonstrated in all through the Old Covenant that, that uh, the, the practice of the faith, the faith of the Almighty God, the Creator of the universe, His Son, our Lord, our Sa Savior, He proclaimed it when He said, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because He's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. The idea is that the marginalized, the edgy communities, the disenfranchised, those who are on the margins, those who are oppressed, those are the focus of ministry and anyone that's out of step with that focus is out of step with the missio dei, the mission of God in the earth. And that requires an ontological morphology such that as we critically engage with the faith, we are changed so that we see those in the margins 
differently, how we love brothers and sisters that don't speak the same language and come. We call them aliens and immigrants, how we engage with the poor, how we engage with the otherly abled, how we engage with the LBGTQAI community, how we engage with the divorced, how we engage with people who we have heretofore marginalized and been comfortable relegating to hell. When I believe a critical engagement with the faith, empowered by the Holy Spirit, will call us into an ontological morphology, a change of our nature, such that we fall in love with that which Jesus died for and proclaimed in Luke chapter 4. He came for the poor, for the incarcerated, those that are bound. He came for, to reform health care, those that are bruised. He came for prison reform, those that are incarcerated. He, he, he came to deal with all of these marginal issues. I think for, far too often the church is so interested in preachers and pastors and leaders are so interested in being mainstream that we miss the whole method of Jesus. We preach his message, but we don't live his methods. I want to challenge you to think differently and let that rumination of the faith change your whole ministry. Here's the last thing I'm going to say. And that is, contemplating the faith provides for us the sacramental grace. And while I realize that some of us are not sacramental Christians and that we don't believe in the means of grace that comes through performative speech and performative acts, I want to challenge you to think differently about sacrament, about study as sacrament, about the fact that as you come to the table of the Lord in Eucharist, or what some of you call communion, or the waters of baptism, or a foot washing, or of laying on of hands, and, and, and uh, uh, chrism, the anointing with oil. As we perform these acts, and as we minister in these ways, as we spend time engaging with God at the altar, that we need to see study as an altar of sacramental grace. That as I read, I literally am encountering God as I study and contemplate, ruminate the things of the faith. I'm encountering the Spirit and the Spirit is bringing about a transformation in my life. I want to challenge you to see your studies, your writing, your exegetical work, your papers, all of the things that you're tasked to do in this academic and intellectual pursuit. I want you to see it as sacrament. And when you do so, Every book that you read, every paper you write, every exercise that you perform will invite grace. You'll see it then as a means of grace and you'll be filled with the grace of God to carry out the work that he's called you to do through study. I'm Bishop Jonathan Alvarado, Senior Pastor of Grace Church International, the Total Grace Movement, Presiding Bishop of the Grace Fellowship of Churches, President and Professor of Theology of the Greater Atlanta Theological Seminary. I want to challenge you to grow in holy contemplation, the rumination of the faith, and how it influences and impacts your daily life as Christian and as leader. May the Lord be with you. Father, today as we reflect upon your goodness and your mercy, we intercede for those who are desiring to learn about you in a much deeper way. We ask that you continue to guide their minds and their heart on this journey to discover your power. God, you've been so gracious to us by giving us the gift of salvation through the blood of Jesus Christ. And I ask that all who are partaking in this moment of chapel are reminded of your presence and your glory. Father, we intercede for those who are in need of your love and your guidance. We also intercede for those who are in need of the clarity of your voice and ask that you meet them right where they are. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. As we have heard and contemplated, let us allow the light of Christ to illumine and guide our thoughts and deeds in the height of this day. May we pause to rest in Him, quiet our minds, 
Feel our hearts that we may abide in love and trust. May the Spirit of Christ overshadow our entire life. Christ under us, Christ over us, Christ beside us, and Christ in us. Go forth to love and serve the Lord.